Today I want us to look Tinne Amerwa Neno at the message of salvation. Lok me lare reached by Paul and Barnabas. Ma Paulo gene gene bara bage tuju on their first missionary journey. It is given na machen. Now considering chapter 13. Kawa neno a a chura ne a pa we deck a verses 1. Chenge a chen. There are some important things for us to consider. Tiki mama pele te to twale wa kwa neno kinyo. It says wachi now there was in the church. Neno te ikani at Antioch. E Antioch. Now what is very outstanding here? We saw in the previous chapters how Christians were first of all called Christians at a place that was known as Antioch. So it was a gentle place but the gospel penetrated into those areas that even if those that didn't have a convent relationship with God. They were also now called Christians. But it says now there in the church at Antioch, Antioch prophets and teachers now this is very amazing. The combination of prophets and teachers simply refers to all of gospel ministers during the early church. So all of them were together. And remember prophets and teachers were so very much foundational in the early church because a lot had to be established. A lot had to be put in place. So what do we have here? It says Barnabas Simeon who was called a nigger the story about this man that is known as uh, Simon Nigger. It is believed that his hair was too black. Then the other thing, the Bible says uh, Lucius of Serene and then Manen, a member of the court of Herod, the Tetrarch. So that is to mean that Manen was raised in the house of a Herod the king. That's why the Bible refers to him as the member of the court of Herod. But what is very outstanding they were all gathered in the church. My dear ones the church is a place for the believers. God does not build his church on unbelievers. He builds his church on believers. He uses the believers that have come to a place of the greater confession that Jesus Christ is the Lord. If you can remember very well, there was a particular actually mentioning that was made of Simon Peter. Simon Peter. If we may just consider from Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. So I want us to fully understand this. When you talk about the church, the word church comes from the Greek word that is known as ekelesia, which simply means the called out ones. So God calls us from the word to himself so we might show forth his praise unto all men. But now starting with verse 13 of Matthew 16 now when Jesus came when Jesus came came into the district of Caesarea Philippi he asked uh, his disciples who do people say that the son of man is? Verses 14. And they said, Some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. Others say Jeremiah. And others one of the prophets. In verses 15. And he said unto them. Now remember that them. Are those of the inner circle. 
These are the so-called disciples. Now there's something very important for us to learn here. Every time we refer to what the church is. There's one thing that is known as the great confession. We can have the unbelievers join us. And they hear the message. But before they repent of their sins they are not known as members of the church of Christ you follow that because Christ is church is a church of true believers it's not actually a place of unbelievers you need to understand that look at 15 but he said unto them who do you say that I am 16 Simon Peter replied Simon Peter you are the Christ the son of the living God what makes up a true church the people should have that great confession acknowledging that Christ is indeed the son of the living God if that is not true then there is not a church we should call it another thing so the church is a place where individuals have come to that greater confession as if that is not enough in verses 17 it says and Jesus answered him blessed are you Simon Bajona meaning son of Jonah for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. Pay attention also to that. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. What do we have? It doesn't say. But my father who is in heaven that is to me the true church of God depends on to the revelation that has been given to us from the above. That is God God is written words. We have the greater confession and at the same time we depend on that revelation that has been given to us from above and that is God is written words. Simon who do not have known that indeed Christ is the son of the living God. If God had not made it known to him. We know who Christ is according to the writings of what? Of the scriptures. You follow that? So that is very important. And so now in the Bible says in Acts 13 that they were in the church and by the time the Bible calls them prophets and teachers that is to mean they had met those qualifications. These these are individuals that were acknowledging that indeed Christ is the son of the living God. They were not separated somewhere else but was a body of believers gathering together. That's the church. More emphasis to that. Let us also use 1 Peter chapter 2. So what I desire for each and every one of you truly understand what the church is and the church is you it's not this tent it's not a building it's those believers that have made a confession so when we are gathered together we form what we call a church we don't go to church we have a church that goes where we meet but it's a common thing you hear with people. I'm going to the church. You are the church. The book of 1 Peter 2. Verses 9. It says, but you are a chosen race. A royal priesthood. A holy nation. That's who 
God calls us. We are chosen. We are royal. We are holy nation. Another important thing. A people for his own possession. He separated us from the world for his own purpose. For his own glory. That's why he separated us out of the system of the world. Meaning the church should never resemble the world. The moment you say that you are a church, you cease doing things the way unbelievers do. Because you are what? You are God's own possession. You mirror for others. But this is how a Christian looks. This is how a God fearing person looks. So if we are for God's own possession, also means we cease doing what actually appears to be appealing to us and we seek to praise Him. Because if we are for His own possession, He owns us. He's the one to command us. He's the one to to instruct us. We are to seek the issue of honoring him, the issue of adoring him, the issue of glorifying him in all areas of our lives. Listen, listen. That you may proclaim the excellences of him who called you out of darkness. If we say that we are believers, we we don't live in darkness. We live in light. Because our God is light. We are the light of the world. And we are to continue. Allow our light to shine. So darkness. Is not our identity. Light is our identity. We do things of light. We don't do things of darkness. So if you're a believer, broad daylight and night hours, you should be the same person. You should not be good when the sun is out. But when the night hours come, you become a vampire. That is not a Christian. A Christian is single. In the light and in darkness. But those that are outside, the Bible calls them the children of darkness. Because all their ways, they are modeled after darkness. But for us, that we may actually proclaim the excellences of him who called us out of darkness. Dear ones, all unbelievers before God, they are actually in darkness. There is no light in them because they have not received the light. John 8 says Jesus said that I am the light of the world. So him that has not received Christ is in darkness. Why? Because it is Jesus who takes out our darkness. That's the Bible teaching. Called out out of darkness into his marvelous light. Look at it. Once you were not a people before you were born again, you were not a people. But what does it say? But now, and now means now, you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. That is to me that unbelievers have not yet received the mercy of God. But if they are to die in their sins, they are actually lost forever. But now that's the thing that I wanted us to also fully understand. Now, considering verses 2 of Acts 13, it says, while they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, 
common traits of believers is worshiping the Lord. Worshiping the Lord. It's a form of us ministering to Him. Hebrews 13. We may just consider verses 15. It says, Through Him, then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. It's a mandate for all believers to praise God. Because we know who He is to us. We know we came from Him. And to Him we owe everything. So it says, The fruit of lips that acknowledge His name. Look at 16. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. So how do we minister to God? We offer to Him our sacrifice of praise. We do that which is good because that is what pleases Him. Back to Acts chapter 13. So now that's the thing that we need to understand. And the Bible says as they were worshipping the Holy Spirit said the Holy Spirit said now that's the third person of the Godhead. This is what he said. He said set apart for me Barnabas and Saul. Now this is the thing that we also need to understand. The separation of Paul and Barnabas happened when they were actually in submission to a particular church. God does not call the unbelievers to serve him. He calls those that belong to his church to serve him. And I'm saying it again. God does not call the unbelievers to serve him. He calls those that belong to his church to serve him. What do we see here? Paul and Barnabas they were gathered together in a church at a place that was known as Antioch. So the separation actually funded them or actually it came when they were gathered with a body of believers and there the Holy Spirit spoke and said set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. Now all ministers of God they ought not to be idle. God wants all his children to be busy doing something. So he was not calling them to actually sit somewhere idle. But he was separating them for a particular work. All of us there is a particular work that the Lord has separated us unto. And in doing that work we are giving glory to him. That even us that are teaching the word teaching before God is known as work. Look at 1 Timothy 3. All gospel ministers they are also supposed to labor in the issue of the word and doctrine. 1 Timothy 3.1 The saying is trustworthy. If anyone desires the office of, of, of the overseer remember overseer same thing that means a bishop the same thing that means an elder the same thing that means a pastor it says that whoever desires the office 
of overseer he desires a noble work so teaching and preaching his work so now even these guys they were separated for a particular work and that work was only known by the Holy Spirit then look at verse 3 then after fasting and praying they laid their hands on them now who laid their hands on them these are the elders of the church the church does not give us any gifting but it is within the church that our gifts are discovered and after our gifts are discovered the church can now commission us a person should not send himself a person should have a body of believers that are so very much acquainted with him and they know his ability and therefore even if it means doing something to do with church planting those are the same individuals that will second that individual he will be accountable to them they will also have his back and the Bible says they laid their hands so the laying of the hands has nothing to do with maybe releasing something onto that person. The laying of the hands has to do with actually recognizing a gift that is upon that person. That because we have realized this is this is what was given to you, we agree you go and do the work. You go and help many others. But today, most actually denominations have not understood this. People thinking that they are the ones to ordain ministers. So that thing is, God is the one who separates his people. And then for us as the church, we only recognize that which God has placed upon that individual. The other thing that we also need to understand, this was not the first time for Paul, I mean for, for, for Barnabas and Saul to do the ministry work. We saw in Acts chapter 9 that Paul was called in Acts chapter 9 and there and then he began to preach. In chapter 11 we also saw Barnabas teaching in, in Antioch. So, but this one here this separation was an appointment for the missionary work that they were commissioned to. Now let us consider verses 4. It says, So being set out by the Holy Spirit, the one who actually said that they should be separated is the same one that actually also sent them out. So they went down to Seleucia. That is to me. The one who called, he also directed where they had to go. And from there, they sailed to Cyprus. Look at verses 5. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God. That's the beauty of it. The ones that were sent, what happened to them? They did not get into stories. They shared the word of God. The issue about a saint minister is to actually put an emphasis onto the teaching and the preaching of the word. So what really happened? Barnabas and Saul they never went into stories. Our pulpits should do not be occupied by men who are storytellers. Our pulpits should be actually filled with men that are so very much equipped and skilled in the issue of right dividing of the word of God. But today there are many that go actually contrary to the written word of God. 
So when they were commissioned, the church had prepared them. They knew what to do. They knew how to conduct themselves. And if they were out there, they knew the right thing was to preach the word. Listen to what happened. The Bible says uh, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. The beauty about this is to understand that every time these apostles were commissioned to go somewhere, they availed themselves an opportunity of first of all reaching out to the Jews. The thing is very clear. In Romans 1.16, Paul writes and he says that I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But it is the power of God unto many salvation. To the Jews first. Don't forget that. To the Jews first. The thing is, the Bible puts an emphasis as far as this book of Acts is concerned that this message would always go first of all to the Jews. Because salvation belongs to the Jews. Before they could actually reject it, the Lord allowed the continuous pumping of his gospel to the Jews so that they receive that privilege of receiving it first. Why do we say what we say? Romans 15. In verses 8 will do better. For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God his truthfulness. Now, now this verse is very crucial to what we are about to discover. So I pray that you don't forget it. For I tell you that Christ became the servant to the circumcised to show God his truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the fathers. So before Jesus became our savior, he was first of all sent to the nation of Israel to fulfill all the promises God had made Abraham to Isaac, to Jacob, Jacob, and many others in the line. That is why the Bible showeth us that every time these apostles would get an opportunity, they would first make this truth known to the Jews. And for us, what does the Bible command us to do? We are to take the gospel to them. And we are to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Why? Those people gave us the prophets. They gave us uh, the Savior. And they also gave us the Holy Scripture. So the least we can do for the Jews is to evangelize to them and also to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Those are all in Romans 15. And in the book of Psalms. But so now I want you to know this and be very systematic in your observation that wherever Paul would go and the rest of others they would first make sure that much as Paul himself was commissioned to go to the Gentiles he would first spare some time to preach first of all to the Jews. So by the time you hear him in Romans 10 saying these words brothers my heart desire and prayer to God for them is that they might be saved the man loved his brother so much the same way so loyal to go back to your brother and evangelize to them so he says in verses 2 for I bear them witness they have a zeal for 
God. But not according to the knowledge. It has become so very common. But it's not only the Jews that had actually the zeal. That was not according to the true knowledge. But that thing has spread all over the world. Many people are zealous. But their knowledge is not according to the truth. Why? They have not been taught. The teaching is so very much rare in the modern day churches. Untrue teachings. They have become the staple food for so many Christians. That's why the truth makes many people uncomfortable. But when you lie to them, they are energized. You see, everyone is happy. Because you have told them the language that they are used to. And the thing of allowing the scriptures to speak it is so foreign to the modern day believers. It says in verses, uh, verses uh, 5 when they arrived at Salamis they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they had John Mark assist them. Now that's a self explanatory verse. John Mark was a simple deacon. John Mark no And hoping uh, actually these apostles no in few and actually minor activities. Look at verse 6. And when they had gone through the whole island as far as Pamphos they came upon a certain magician. I come like now you can imagine these guys being on their first missionary journey they bump into an enemy of the gospel this is what has always been the enemies of the gospel have always been around they are always those individuals that wish nothing good for the spreading of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ the devil knows the power that is in the gospel. That's why he keeps many people blinded. He makes sure that he makes them busy with unnecessary things. Because it's the gospel that takes all our blindness. It actually brings us to a place of knowing that all along we have been lost. Whenever the devil can have an opportunity, he will use it to hinder the spreading of the gospel. You come to think of this. It is the first missionary journey. But there and then, they bump into this as sorcerer. Let us understand him more. The Bible says, they came upon a certain magician. Today, they might not be very common. Drunkards telling you, please, first go away. Don't preach it here. And many others. But the Bible says, a Jewish false prophet. He was named by Jesus. The name Jesus in the Hebrew. Actually, it is the same as Joshua. So to the Hebrews, when you talk about Jesus and Joshua, there's no difference. There is no difference. But so the Bible says, a Jewish false prophet that within the Jews there was a false prophet. So from the early time, the false ones have always been around. You and I should not be surprised to see the mushrooming up of so many false prophets. They have always been around and they will continue to be around. 
Until the second coming of our Lord. When he will have to do away with them. So we need to be so very much acquainted with the scriptures. To know who is false and who is true. But they all come actually with some uh, with something that symbolizes them as people belonging to the truth. He was a magician. And he was also uh, with, with, uh, with a proconsul Sagias who was called uh, Paulus a, a man of intelligence who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word. So if you've evangelized before you know this you meet some people very much opened wanting to hear the word but having others that try to deter them from hearing the word. So this magician stayed with individuals one of them was known as Paulus and Paulus wanted to hear the word but around him was an individual with an evil eye and he never wanted them to hear the gospel. So what does the Bible say? It says that uh, he sought to hear an common thing today. And I know you people you can attest. There are few people that would want to hear the word. But the Bible says Paulus was a man of intelligence. You cannot say that those who do not want to hear the word are not men of intelligence. But this was a character of Paula. He was not only intelligent, but he also sought to hear the word. However, the obstacle comes in verses 8. The Bible says, But Elimas, this same guy that we saw in verse 6, this is also his other name. Elimas the magician. So the, the thing is, but Elimas. Now when the but comes in, is to show the effect of Elimas that he had on Paulus. And those that are preachers of the gospel. But Elimas. And today we have so many Elimas. Their main business is this. Opposing the gospel. They cannot preach it. But they do not even want those who preach it. They know nothing about it. But again. They try to get in the way of it. The, the Bible is very clear. They are the opposers of the gospel. Have always been around. You remember when Moses was sent in Egypt. The Bible speaks of uh, Janice and Jambres. They opposed Moses. They posed him with Aaron. So they were magicians. When Moses would do this miracle, they would try also to duplicate it. Those are all in the character of Elimas. They are opposers of the gospel. In the New Testament, one of the prominent ones was known as Elimas. And another one was known as Alexander the Coppersmith. Actually, Paul spoke of him by saying that he has hindered our work everywhere. Let me see if I can get a 2 Timothy 4. 2 Timothy 4. Alexander the Coppersmith did me great arm. The Lord repay him according to his deeds. Be aware of him. We cannot associate with the enemies of the gospel. 
Bible tells us to be aware of them. This is the apostle saying. He was sent to Timothy. This guy has overstood us. Uh, even when I'm gone, be aware of him yourself. For he strongly opposed our message. And I'm telling you, there are many today unknowingly who are in the very character of Elimas, of Elimas, of, Elimas, of uh, actually Alexander the Copper Smith. The Bible also is very clear. Such individuals are also in the character of the Pharisees. In Luke 11 52. Who held the key of knowledge? They themselves were not entering to get the truth. And even those that desired to enter in, they hindered them from entering. My dear ones, these are realities. There is nothing new that we are seeing today. All the oppositions that we are seeing today, we should be comforted. By those that were used of the Lord before us. Because they also encountered the same issues. They had the same scenarios. Coming to them. The Bible says. But Elimas. Opposed them. Look at that. Seeking to turn. Away. The faith of Paulus. And all those other colleagues. What was his main intention? The intention of those that oppose the gospel is to turn away other people's faith. And so the warning is given here. My dear ones, whoever you know that opposes the gospel, their main ideal, their main reason in doing that is to turn others away from faith. That's why the Bible is very clear. A person who has a wrong teaching, we should not only mark that person, but we should also avoid that person. So early must have to be avoided. The likes of Alexander have to be avoided. The likes of Janice and Jambris of our time, they have to be actually avoided. Okay, let us look at verse 9. But Saul, who was also called Paul, now if you're very well conversant with whatever we covered in the past, you realize this is the first mentioning of the name that is known as Paul. All along he was referred to as Saul. So this was the first mentioning of Paul and it was also the last actually mentioning of the name Saul referring to, to Paul. So now this actually also means that the name Paul was also to introduce us to the actually to much of the things that is to do with what the Lord would accomplish with this gentleman. Because as we, are, we continue to see the writings that we do have uh, in the book of Acts after chapter 15 more time is spent on talking about the work of Paul until the end of the book so it says but Saul was also called Paul filled with the Holy Spirit in other words he was under the influence of the Holy Spirit and he looked intently at him verse 10 and he said you son of the devil why was he calling him son of the devil follow through and then you son of the devil you are an enemy of all righteousness. Now that is it. All sons of the devil they are individuals that are against what is righteous. They are individuals that are full of deceit. That are full of craftiness. This is who Elimas was. So in his face he says you enemy 
enemy of all righteousness. And full of deceit. This is how Jesus referred to the devil. He said that he is the father of all liars. And since the devil is the father of all liars. Where? That father of all liars will go into the lake of fire. All liars will follow him. This is who Elimas was. He was a liar. And trying to turn other people's faith away from the Lord. So the Bible says. Will you not stop. Perverting the ways of the Lord. That is to mean. It was always his business. To pervert. The ways of the Lord. And always opposing. Always getting in the way. Of the truth. But now here another thing that we need to pay attention to. Is something that is to do. Is something that is to do with. The apostolic judgments. The first one that we considered. Was in Acts chapter 5. If you remember actually. Uh, Ananias and Sapphira dying at the word of, of Peter. So now we are going to see the second one. These apostles were not only doing the signs and wonders. They were not only the preachers of the truth. But they could also. Release judgment. Upon the enemies of the gospel. And even in their judgment were instant as their sins and wonders were. Look at verse 11. Now behold the hand of the Lord is upon you. The same thing Peter said to, 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 to Ananias and Sapphira. That you have not lied to man but you've lied to God. So now Elima supposing uh, Paul and Barnabas it it was beyond these two individuals. It was an opposition against God's own word. So whoever comes against God's word, in one or the other, if you oppose the ministers of the gospel, I mean the true ministers, you are opposing God himself. Because they carry his word. So that is why Paul says to this guy, Behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you. Now, this is why we call it the apostolic judgment. He uses the command. Today, we hear this common notion. Touch not God is anointed. But there's nothing that happens. The one day you say that you've touched God is anointed, He continues to live on. But look at this one here. He says, You'll be blind. Listen, then you'll be blind and be and unable to see the sun for a time. Listen, listen. And the Bible says what? Immediately. Chut, chut. These were God's anointed. Not the ones we have in today. There and then. Chut, chut. A mist fell on his eyes. Uh, now you hear people claiming the same apostolic authority. That are most an apostle. Like the Lord reveals to me things. You cannot even make someone have a headache. This one here he said you will not be able to see the sun for a time. But let me tell you my dear ones. Even to they that are enemies of the gospel. The Lord is very gracious towards them. This was not actually a permanent blindness. The judgment was also full with the mercy of God. Because if it is me he would have a permanent one. But look at where the Lord says. You will not be able to see for a time. But he's an enemy of the gospel. And God being very gracious. He allows it to be for a season. And immediately. The so-called magician. 
You see, they claim the power that they never have. This was an imposter. He claimed to be something that he was not. It is the power of God that exposes all of those that call themselves what they are not. Because he was a magician. Why didn't his magic? Why didn't his sorcery? Actually, reverse the blindness. So you keep on fearing the witch doctors. And you say, I am God's own special possession. Shame on you. You say, God is only child. But they say, COVID. Give me the vaccination. Just, just put it here. And I'm talking to someone. <laughs> They know. <laughs> Someone runs very fast. <laughs> Officer, don't worry. <laughs> My arm is here. <laughs> Just give me <laughs> that. <laughs> <laughs> and the Bible says and darkness fell upon him and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand you see unbelievers they want always to reach to this place they are hopeless they are weak but they still need to go to show to them that they are weak he is now seeking for a person to lead him all along is blind spiritually but now God doubles it with the physical blindness show him that you are lost the message you're opposing is the only message that will take out all your blindness and actually it came on him but when you read in two, actually the early history there are a lot of accounts that really reveal that later on the so called Elimas by God's grace converted. That's how gracious God is. So, but in verses 12, then the officer believed the officer, like a, a, an important person, <laughs> he believed when he saw what had occurred. So they thought Elimas was legit. But the gospel of Christ that Paul and Barnabas were preaching it exposed him that he had nothing that they had to believe in Elimas' things. So when they saw that they believed and they were astonished. They were astonished at the teaching of the Lord. This is what Paul says in Romans 1. That the gospel is the power. Magicians don't have. All of those that call themselves something. If they are outside Christ. They are nobodies. Very important stuff. Verse 13. And now Paul. And his companions set herself from Pamphos and uh, came to Paga. These are all good names you can use for your children. In Pamphylia, <laughs> and the Bible says, and John left them and returned to Jerusalem. So we don't know so very much well what prompted John to go back. However, we might think think because there were several other new areas that uh, the apostles had to travel to. Probably John was so scared about those new lands and he was scared. You hear the name of this place. Pamphos, Paga, Pamphylia and John left. 
Wego. He desired at first to go. Chen, Mirna, Wego, Dark Chen. They are those characters. Ticket Mwego ni. Let us preach the gospel. Ah, what do you call my bear? Let's let us preach it. Yeah, what you wrong? But in some areas, Erica Bermukana, they disappear. Giruen B. It has been always like that. And Obero Kerkumino. And now the clear note about this. Ah, Lok Matika Malay community. We shall discover it. One of the children, Yang. Later on in chapter 15. Kunge Chenga Pawe Beach. Where Paul shows that in one or the other. Kama Paulo Nyoro Yuachel Nyomukana. Maybe John was so scared. Well, John. He had maybe for seen the beatings that were waiting for them. So he said, I'd rather return to Jerusalem. Where my mother is. Where prayers were conducted for Peter. But, 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 and so in verses 14 yeah, but they went on from Paga and they came to Antioch in Pisidia now this is not the same Antioch that St. Paul and Barnabas in those days the name Antioch was a favorable name and it was a common name that was used so to distinguish this Antioch from the one where Christians were first of all called Christians. It is, the Bible brings it like this. They came to Antioch in Pisidia. In Pisidia. Indicating as a different one. Distinguishing it from the other one. Now I want you again to understand. The same thing that we saw earlier. The apostles. Availing themselves of an opportunity. Of always taking the gospel to the Jews first. This come with clear observation of the text. When you're not reading to finish. But with an observable eye. Some of the things you can be able to see. So it says that uh, and on the Sabbath day they went into the synagogue and sat down. Look at 15. And after reading from the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue. Now these rulers have to be understood as people that were responsible for reading a particular portion of the text on the Sabbath day they sent a message to them saying brothers have you seen that on the Sabbath day Paul and Barnabas they went there to the Jews that were scattered in these gentle places and, it, and so this guy said Brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it in verses 16. So Paul stood up and motioning with his hand, another is doing like this. You keep quiet. Uh, you listen. Verses are, uh, uh, he went on to say, Men of Israel, and you who fear God, listen. Win. Now this is actually a short a narrative that is to do with the redemptive history as far as actually what God accomplished with, uh, with, the, with the nation of Israel the promises he made to the fathers and it is somehow connected to the same narrative that Stephen gave when he was on trial he showed those guys who the true Israelis are how they started what went on happening so even Paul he had to take these guys first to their history and within their history was enough truth to bring them 
come to faith. So I pray that you endure it for a time. And then we shall finish. This is what it says. In verse 17. The God of these people. Israel. Chose our fathers. And you made them great. During their stay in Egypt. What is very amazing. He made them great in slavery. That's the meaning of the text. The God of these people chose our fathers and made them the great people. Listen. When did, when did he make them great? During their stay. It is very amazing. Someone is in slavery. But God has exalted them. This is who the Israelis were. Let us follow through the text again. In verses, uh, doesn't say, and, and with a lifted arm, he led them out. The lifted arm refers to the strong arm of God refers to the divine power that God exhibited when he was delivering them out of Egypt. If you have that story, if you have that knowledge of it, you'll understand that several things were exercised. Verses 18, for about 40 years, he put up with them in the wilderness. The meaning is very clear. That they had bad manners. But he endured their bad manners. He endures our bad manners sometimes. He says, I know Kenneth will change. Because we are also on the journey. Our citizenship is in heaven. But as we live as sojourners here, sometimes we exercise bad manners. But the Lord endures us. Just like a father would endure his stubborn son. And said, I know he, they will change. So what happens? In 19. After destroying seven nations. This is very amazing. After destroying seven nations. These nations, if you read them. They all have what we call ites. 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 That is I-T-E-S. Let me give you a sample of it. In Deuteronomy 7. Verses 1. Uh, but these are not good names for your children. Please stay away from this. You listen to this name. Bible says. In chapter 7. And when the Lord. Your God brings you out. Into the land. You are entering in to take possession of it and clears away many nations before you. The first one is what? Hittites. Hittites. Heights. Another one. Jinga Heights. Jinga Heights. There is more Heights. Then uh, the Canaanites. Perizzites. Perich. Hivites. Evite. And uh, the Jebusites. Jebusite. Those are all nations. That they were having those that land. No getting but because they were his special people, he displaced all those ones and said, You go away. You are full of your idols. Let those ones who fear me take over your life. That's what he did to those now guys. Now look at verses 20. And, and all this took about 450 years. And after that, he gave them judges until some of the prophets. Now these judges were also to work as defenders for the Israelis. And uh, when you study it very well, the prominent judge people know him as Samson. Samson. But there are others like Deborah, like Japheth. There were so many. But even in them, their lives were not okay. 
know the story about Samson. He received an haircut. Over a woman. So the Bible says, and then they asked for a king. That is also very profound. When you study the book of 1 Samuel, Samuel chapter 8, when they said to Samuel, uh, speak to God. It's high time. We also be like other nations. Because we want to be like other nations. And so they were in one or the other. Declaring independence from God. Say we want to live on our own. We want to resemble all those other nations. And the Bible says. And God gave them soul. The son of Kish. A man of the tribe of Benjamin. For 40 years. Now, Saul was given to them not in God's pleasure. He gave them Saul as his judgment to them. Because all kings were to come from the tribe of Judah. But they were permitted to have Saul. And Saul became Saul for them. <laughs> so now here. And when he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king. Of whom he testified and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, the man after my own heart, who will do all my will. Now David being called the, the, the man after the heart of God, simply means that he was obedient to God and he led the Israelites according to the divine will of God. He was a special king. Verses 23. And of this man's offspring God has brought up to Israel a savior Jesus as he promised. 24. Before his coming that is who? The savior that has been known as Jesus. John had proclaimed the baptism of repentance to the people of Israel. And as John was finishing his, his course, he said, what do you suppose that I am? I am not she. No. But behold, after me, one is coming and the sandals and the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to untie. 26. Brothers, sons of the family, that is what the Jews knew of themselves. Now this is Paul talking to them. He says, brothers, sons of the family of Abraham, but how can you say? Just listen. There is a message that he was bringing to them. And it is the message of salvation. It says, brothers, sons of, of Abraham, those things among you, and those among you, who fear God, to us has been sent this message of salvation. Because it was already prophesied. 27. For those who live in Jerusalem, and their rulers, because they did not recognize him, not understand the teaching of the prophets which I read every Sabbath. It is very amazing that they were teaching from the prophets things concerning Jesus by the rulers in Israel. They never understood anything. The same thing Alex you were telling me yesterday. People read the Bible but they don't understand. Imagine every Saturday they went into the preach the teachings of the prophets. And the, those teachings of the prophets. 
prophets. They are They included everything that would happen to Christ. But no one understood. But they attended every every Sabbath. And they were reading from the same. Just like so many believers today. How long have you been born again? In Can a Christian be demon possessed? Of course. Of course. Then you say 30 years in salvation? You don't know that a Christian cannot be demon possessed? Someone tell you, my brother, you are wrong. Even if you're a Christian, you can be demon possessed. 30 years. <laughs> Not even what they are supposed to know. They don't know. They are only counting years. They know how long they have been around. The Bible says every Saturday. Okay, let me read again verse 27. For those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers because they did not recognize him no understand the address of the prophets which are read every Every Sabbath fulfilled them by condemning him. The prophets were saying that the people of Israel they will end up killing their own Messiah. No wonder the Bible is very clear in the New Testament. In 1 Corinthians 2 8, that had they known him, they would not have crucified him. But they never understood anything. Thing. You find someone busy reading. Don't fear to ask. And say, do you understand what you're reading? People are reading, but they don't understand. But verses 20, yeah. 29 comes in. Although they found him, I mean, although they found in him no guilt, worthy of death, they asked Pilate to have him killed. 29. And when they had carried out all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree. Now pay attention. They are not the ones who took him. They are not the ones who took him down. For them they only fulfilled what was written of him. The ones who took Jesus off. The, the ones that took him off from the cross were his sacred disciples. People like Joseph of Arimathea. People like Nicodemus. When you study John 19, John verses 38 and 39. So verses 30. But God raised him from the dead. And for many days, he appeared to those who had come up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, Jerusalem who are now his witnesses to the people. Verse 32 the Bible says and we bring you this good news that what God promised to the fathers you remember? We read here earlier Romans 15.8 that Jesus was a minister to the circumcised to fulfill all the promises that were made to the fathers. The Bible explains the Bible. 32. This he has fulfilled to us their children by raising Jesus as also it is written in the second psalm you are my son today I have begotten you. 34. And as for the fact that he has raised him from the dead and no more to return. These were all written in the, in the prophets. That this Messiah was to die and he was known to see actually corruption. But much as all these things were written in the, in the prophets, the ones that were reading from the prophets every 
Sorry, Sabbath. Jo Duchman, get a quangue book, but never see ambition. They never understood it. They killed their own message. The issue was what? They didn't pay attention to what the prophets wrote. And today, there are many today that have not understood that which is written. And they are doing things contrarily. But in verses uh, 35, therefore, he says also in another Psalm. You will not let one, you will not let your holy one see corruption. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his generation, he fell asleep and was laid with his fathers so corruption. So David was not the Messiah. But out of his lineage, God raised the Messiah and his name is Christ and he fulfilled everything. So, but now after all this was given I can reassure you of one simple thing. They still never believed. And that we shall consider next week. Let us appreciate. 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 Let us appreciate